Welcome everybody to Drum Education Live episode 47 and we have Mike Johnston here. Hey. Yeah! Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. And thank you for putting the T in my last name. Most people just say Johnson. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> my dad would be so bummed. But uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Kira is, very, Kira is very particular with names pronunciation. I don't know why. <laughs> as, she, as she should be. If she's lived a full life of, of, of teachers calling out her name on day one of school and saying it wrong, then she should yeah. be particular. This is my life. It's fine. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a question we ask most people, and it's about education. And what do you think is missing from, from education, if anything? Well, I would say the biggest thing that's missing in general education, and obviously it trickles down to drum education too, would be, it's kind of a dual thing of passion from the educator along with empathy from the educator. And I think a lot of times when you have people that are very good at anything in this world and maybe things didn't fall the way they wanted to for their career, they end up teaching. But the problem is they might be good because they're kind of natural at it. And then when they're in the room with a student, if they don't have empathy, they're not really understanding what the student is going through. Like no student has ever been in any of our lesson rooms trying to fail. They're always doing their best. And I, I've just, I've had those teachers where I just thought to myself, I think you might be natural at foot speed because you keep asking me to do something that I cannot do, but you're not giving me any tools to do it. So I think passion is one that's super important. Like if I, as the student can feel that you'd rather be on tour, this lesson's over. Like yeah. you're, you're not passionate about education. And two, if there's an empathy from the teacher to the student about that student's very specific journey, then I think the lesson is over as well. And that's why it's so important. I remember Pete Magadini, who was my long-term teacher, at some point he stopped me while I was apologizing for messing up. And he was like, Hey, I work for you. You are paying me. Stop acting like you're working for me. And I was like, but you're Pete Magadini and you, you know, you wrote the books I study out of. And he's like, but you're paying for these lessons. So we'll figure this out together. And I was like, okay, I think I'm going to be a teacher for the rest of my life just because of you. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I feel like that's what every teacher needs to say, you know, totally. I and, and, and the teacher needs to feel that way too. I think that that's so important. It's always so important for all of us as teachers to constantly ask the student, hey, what are you into? Who's your favorite band? Who's your favorite drummer? Do you not have a favorite band? I mean, we're in a very different time now than if you were teaching 20 years ago. There's a lot of students that I have that don't have a favorite band because there's not a lot of bands. They, have, they might even have, they might not have a favorite artist. They just have a favorite song. And so it's like, oh, that's cool. Now that I know your favorite song, let me expose you to the artists and the bands and the actual drum set players that made this thing possible to exist in 2021. But that way, you know, even if I put you on the boring rubber pad, I know what your journey is and I'm getting you closer to your dreams, not to the student before you and not the student after you. Yeah. Cool. Today, today somebody forwarded me a video of an interview with a Brazilian professor. And he said something that's kind of funny, but very true. He said, if you become a teacher to improve your earnings, you know nothing about teaching or earnings. That's uh, <laughs> the second part is very true. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, man, there's teaching just has to be something that you're truly passionate about. If you don't teach, if you don't treat teaching as its own form of art, then I think you're going to really struggle to be a great educator. You know, um, we all put so much time into our instrument. And then a lot of people that are very good at their instrument, whether it be guitar, bass, drums, think, well, now I'll just teach. And it's like, well, you're starting from scratch with teaching. So you're going to have to put in that same amount of time into analogies, comparisons, breaking down explanations, finding three ways to describe time signatures. You're going to have to practice teaching as much as you practiced learning. And I think that, I mean, if you look at the educators in the drum world that are technically my competition, but the ones that I support, it's because there's no getting around it. They're doing it the right way. If you teach in what I consider to be the right way, I've got your back, even if it, you know, takes money out of my pocket. I don't care, you know? Yeah. Um, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people who cannot play gigs 
turned into teachers. But I think also the students, they, they feel, even though if they don't have any experience, if it's their first ever teacher, they can feel it and they don't uh, keep having lessons with this person. I, I had like two or three people now this year that came to me that started with somebody else and they were very, very open saying, yeah, the guy wasn't very good. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that's so important to I me. Mean, I tell my students who want to teach all the time and they say, well, I'm not good enough to teach. And I just, all I say is what is the distance between you and the student? If that distance is great enough, stop comparing yourself to your heroes. The most important thing is, do you want to explain something to someone else? If that's what you want, then all you need is a little bit of distance between you and the student to be able to teach. Cause you're just unlocking one door at a time. We've all experienced what it's like to have the badass student that is actually only one step behind us, but we still want to teach them, but we have to practice all week for their next lesson, but we don't tell them that we've all been there. <laughs> you know, that's, that's part of being a teacher. And, and, and we've also had the students that came in on their first lesson and we had to be honest with them and say, honestly, you're far superior to me. I, there's nothing I can teach you. Um, and I'm going to lose the money by telling you this, but it's what's best for you. So I think that the, you know, when COVID happened, I spent a lot of time, especially when quarantine took place, I spent a lot of time in the beginning helping out other drummers, guitarists, bass players, whatever, set up their tech because I knew, or we all knew they were going to lose their gigs and it was a scary time. But I think the way that students right now, or at least at that time, could have taken advantage of the situation is you might not need a drum lesson from your hero, pay for an hour long conversation with your hero. Find out when they were at your place on this instrument, what were they listening to? Don't ask them what they're listening to now and what they're practicing now. They're, they're 20 years ahead of you. But when they were 15 and they had the same skill set you have, who were their favorite drummers? What rudiments were they focusing on? And that conversation will last you for the rest of your life instead of trying to force an artist into becoming an educator. Mm. Talking about that, how was your... Uh transition from being a uh, on-stage drummer to a full-time teacher was it natural or was one day you woke up and you said nah I, I, I'm gonna change this yeah it it was it was definitely natural because I knew I thought as a child I was just gonna be a school teacher so that was my dream to be a history teacher or an astronomy teacher but I just wanted to teach and then I did get the chance when I was about 17 I was working at a drum shop in California and our main teacher got fired and then they didn't have a replacement. So they just took me from the front counter and put me in as a drum teacher. Um, and then I did that for like three years before I got my first record deal. When I got the record deal, I thought later I'm out, let's go. I'm a touring drummer. I got, you know, there's these things called endorsements. And now I guess this company's going to send me a free drum set. It was great. Um, and it only took like the first U.S. tour. A U.S. tour generally for a rock band is about six weeks. By the end of the first tour, I knew that I wanted to teach for the rest of my life. I just didn't know how to tell my best friends in this band, hey, I know we have the dream, but it's not my dream. And so I stayed as long as I could, which was about six years of touring. And, and I also knew that that touring and having a record deal, those, those things would benefit me greatly as a teacher someday. Someday I'd have a 25 year old student that was about to get a record deal and would ask, should we have a manager? Should we not? I was happy to have a publishing deal and management and lawyers in my past. So I had that experience to pass on to others. Um, the touring life is so not for me. The whole idea of having my drum set in a trailer, 23 hours out of the day, and then I get to play it for 45 minutes at night. And I'm not, I'm not improvising. I'm playing the same eight songs every night. I was like, okay. And, and yeah, eventually I had to tell my bandmates, I understand how much fun you guys are having. I'm in hell. I just want to go back to a room and teach somebody how to do something. So I would say it was a natural progression on the inside. But once again, going back to Pete Magadini, he was the one I was taking lessons with him in between tours. And he was the one that told me, look, man, teaching can be your plan a it doesn't have to be a fallback plan but you do have to choose it you can't fall into it you're going to have to choose it but why can't teaching be a plan a why can't you put everything that you've put into being a touring drummer into being an educator and that was that was a really cool thing to hear because i was a confused 24 25 year old at the time and it was almost like 
kind of coming out of the closet, having somebody say, look, I know that you feel different than everyone around you, but it's okay to feel this way. And having my hero say that, that just empowered me to be like, okay, now I just, I need to find the best way to do this possible um, and do it as responsible as possible. But yeah, it was, it was kind of a freeing feeling for sure. And I've never thought about it twice. I quit totally when I was 26, quit touring and became a full-time teacher at 26. And now I'm 44, 45, excuse me. So uh, 19 years and I've never once, you know, thought like, well, what if, what if Phil Collins said, let's just do one tour, Mike? Like I never thought about it once. It's, I'm Come ready to go. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I've got a question about Phil. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sure if he did call you, you'd be like, yeah, come on. I would do, I, if, if he was, I think he's at that level now where it wouldn't be a tour. He'd be like, Hey, look, I've got a one-off in Egypt. We're playing at the pyramids. I'd be like, I got you. Yeah. Uncle Phil, I'll be there for one, for one date. Um, but yeah, it's, um, but yeah, it's, it's been great just putting everything I have into education. What is it about Phil Collins that you love so much? And why do you think he's given such a bad rap? By mm. I don't think he would have any of that bad rap if it was, if we only knew him from Genesis. I think what happened is he made a solo career and he happened to write incredibly popular, beautiful ballads. And it cheesed out what people knew of him in some people's minds because they wanted that prog thing from Genesis. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people that think of Genesis now think of Phil Collins. But when Genesis was first out, I mean, it was insane what they were doing. It was damn near fusion with pop hooks, especially with Peter Gabriel at the helm and Phil on drums. As far as my thing with Phil, I think it's just that first person that I, you know, kind of imprinted on with videotapes. I had my parents would always buy me concert videotapes because MTV had just kind of started showing live stuff, but we didn't have cable. And so I would just watch concerts all day long as a little kid. Um, and then I would run to my drum room and try to play whatever I heard. And then I would go back and watch the concert. And when I got a, um, it was, I think it was the Butt Seriously Live tour. Um, it was Phil's, like one of Phil's main first tours that he did by himself without Genesis. He had his, a few of his solo hits. Um, and I, excuse me, I said first tours, but one of the first tours that was, you know, made into a DVD or a videotape. And yeah, there was just something about it. Every time he was singing and he'd start to kind of walk slowly back to the kit, I would just start getting the chills. And I was like, go, Phil, go. There's there's 86 toms without bottom heads waiting for you. Just get your ass over there. And then he just, you know, like there was something about it, even though he was left-handed, there was something about watching him and Chester on stage at the same time that was just incredible to me. It was, um, yeah, I don't know. I And then I liked... I liked him. I liked him in between the sets, talking to the crowd. I liked him introducing his band with true care for who was on bass and who was on second trumpet and who was on sax and knowing that he played alto sax instead of Barry sax. I was like, I wonder how many artists actually know any of this stuff, but Phil seems to know his band. So yeah, I just, I loved everything about it and it's never stopped. Cool. cool. Love it. Yeah, I have to confession time. I've, I've heard I've heard of Phil Collins first as a singer and then as a drummer. And I was quite shocked. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> I mean, without the videos, I didn't know. I remember the first time watching the video, I was like, what's he doing? Why is he walking over to that drum kit? Phil, get your come on. <laughs> and then he sat down and said, shadoom, 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 scat, scat. And I just thought, oh, and then, and then like, you know, I mean, at this time I was a kid and, and as I would get older and people would say, you know, who's your favorite band? I'd say Genesis. And they would immediately go, oh, Phil Collins, such a great drummer. And I was like, does everyone know this except for me? How did I not know that this guy played drums? And then luckily I had a really supportive set of parents that would then, they would do their research and buy me a Brand X CD or tape and they would you know, help me out with that and be like, and then here's Phil playing drums on this award show with Eric Clapton on guitar. And, and I just kind of fell into the whole thing. Um, and then really, I mean, from that age wise, all of a sudden grunge happened. And then I got introduced to people like Tim Alexander from Primus, um, obviously Dave Aberzis and what he was doing with Pearl Jam. Um, you know, and even though it's sacrilege to say I wasn't a big Nirvana fan, so Dave Grohl wasn't at that time one of my influences. I gravitated more towards the 
like Tim Alexander. I mean, the guys that were doing the cool stuff and had the double bass and had splash cymbals and um, yeah. And, th and then, but Phil stayed through all of that, through the Weckl phase, through Vinnie Caliuta. I still see <laughs> Phil now and I'm like, get it, buddy. Get it. Yeah. There, there are things that stay with us forever, regardless of what we're, you know, totally. uh, I still have two Chinas, one in each side <laughs> yeah. because, because of a drummer called Frankie Benali, who played in a band called Quiet Riot. You don't have so, to tell me. Come on. Yeah. Come on. So, Feel the noise. You know. Yeah, um, exactly. So, and I and awesome. I had the fusion phase where I didn't listen to anything but fusion, but the two chinas are still there. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, and and you know, Vinny hitting his china, hitting his, you know. So, I mean, I think that that's really important. Though we all need that as educators because we need to find that for our students. Like yeah. when I wanted to quit, Phil got me through. When I thought maybe I just don't get anything. I'd watch that Phil concert over and over and over again because I wasn't, I wasn't into big band like my schoolmates were, and we were all in jazz band together. And they're like, "Oh, you gotta, you gotta get into more Buddy Rich." And I was like, "Yeah, I just, I get it. It's not that I don't get it. I can practice it too. I just don't feel it." And so mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing is like I don't think I've ever showed a student of mine a Phil video ever. Like I don't need you to get into my hero. I need you to find your hero because your hero will pull you through the dark times on this instrument. This is a frustrating instrument. It is. This is like, it goes like bagpipes, drum set. And that's like the level. <laughs> <laughs> it's just right there. And like, and this can oh sound just as bad. I, I don't, I don't like to judge, but I think bad bagpipes, <laughs> it's more frustrating for the listener, but that's it, another it, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> the difference between bagpipes is that even when played correctly, it's still a little tough to listen to. Yeah. Oh, but God, it's a no. frustrating instrument, you know? And I think that we need to find those things for our students to say, look, we all go through this, but when you go through this, just put that video on from when you were a kid or, or put on a little something from your hero, even now if it's obviously a YouTube clip or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or if your hero's still alive, hit their Instagram feed real quick. I mean, that's, but, but that's, that's some, yeah. But that's the thing, is is it a little bit more difficult now? Because it's, it, as you said, especially the younger students, they don't have heroes. Yes, so I think that that's one thing that we as educators have to do, first of all, Educators have to stay current and modern because otherwise they lose the connection with their students and then their advice goes out the window because they can't connect to their students. And they say, well, as soon as you say like in my day, it's over, you lost, the, the student has checked out. So it's my job to, you know, even if, if they say, oh, my favorite song is um, Blueberry Fago. And I'm like, cool. Yeah, no, that's a great tune. And then as soon as the student leaves, I look it up and I'm like, what the hell is that? Um, <laughs> You know, so it's it's important that we stay current so that we can then say, look, I get it. I know it's really hard with everything that Instagram is throwing at you to choose anyone to look up to. But how about we start your Instagram feed from scratch and treat it as a museum? Let's curate your museum. We're only going to add in pieces to your museum that truly inspire you and make you happy. Does this drummer make you happy? Do they inspire you? And it's like, no, they make me want to quit. They're gone. We're still going to follow them, but we're going to mute them. <laughs> but uh, let's let's fill this with skateboarding videos that make you want to go play drums because this person's so good at skating that you want to be that good at drums. Let's fill this with architecture that makes you want to redo your kit and like you know. And so I think curating the museum that is Instagram to be positive for yourself is really really important because we can turn it into a very depressing place if it's only filled with the greatest people at our craft especially when we're just learning a craft, you know? Um, so I just try to, I mean, I probably have five to maybe 10 at the most drummers that I follow. Well, I follow lots, but that aren't muted because they're the ones that make me actually want to practice. And mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I follow Thomas Lang, Virgil Donati, Marco Miniman, Steve Smith, but I don't want to see that when I first wake up. That makes me just want to quit. <laughs> That's not what I want to see. Like they're too good. They're too good looking. They're too. It's just too much. I can't handle it. Can't handle it. I wanted to ask you. You've got this phrase that you use, which um, I love because I think I do it too. Like the uh, embrace the suck. Yeah. You know, I've got and the bracelet and, on right now. Yeah, <laughs> I I love that, and I think um, for me, if I'm frustrated with something, I kind of like it. I yes. like the frustration. Yes. And I, I like the grind and I know I like it because I know I'm going to get through it. Um, 
have you always had that attitude have you always like walked towards a challenge um yes and no i think the first challenge on the instrument that stopped me in my tracks and actually caused me to think maybe this isn't for me i was probably like 15 so at that point i've been taking lessons for about 10 years and that was my first time getting a proper teacher that i chose so for the first 10 years it was just going to the local music store and well he's the drum teacher so that's who i take lessons with but around 15, my ear had developed to finding the cats in my town where I was like, I wish I sounded like you. I want to know how you did it. And so I remember getting my first real teacher that I had chosen. And the first thing he gave me was uh, a samba ostinato with my feet, which I had never played an ostinato other than jazz band stuff, you know, four on the floor with the kick feathered and then two and four on the hi-hat. But I'd never played a, a syncopated ostinato like samba or tumbao or anything like that. And then it was paradiddles with the hands over the top of it. And it just stopped me in my tracks. I mean, it, was, it wasn't even something that I could chip away at one note at a time. I just couldn't do it at all. And that was the first time I thought, okay, I don't think I'm meant for this. And then I showed it to my, my buddies in jazz band that also played drums. And it took them like five minutes to get it down. And I was on like week five and couldn't even do anything. And so that was the very first time I thought, okay, I maybe, not, maybe I'm not cut out for this instrument at all. Went about six months into that thing, one note at a time, almost like taking the notation and ripping up little pieces of paper and moving notes on the ground until I could make it all make sense in my head. And then at six months into it, I finally could do it. My teacher was a, just like, you don't even practice. I was like, I'm doing about eight hours a day, sir. Uh, I do oh practice. God. I'm just really this bad. I'm, I'm <laughs> shockingly terrible at this instrument. <laughs> yeah. um, but that, that one thing, we're still talking about it today, 30 years later, because after that happened, that became the thing that like, well, if I can do paradiddles over a samba, I can do anything, not just on the drums, but in life. So even if Virgil Donati showed me something and I knew like, well, I can't do that. I also know, but I could, I just need enough time. Now that time might be two years, but it took Virgil two days, but just give me enough time and I can chip away at it. So Embrace the Suck came out of, you know, to answer your question, Kira, like there was, then I started living my life that way and didn't really know that I was embracing the suck and I was getting excited about the challenges. And then when I started teaching camps, that's when that phrase came out. And what happened was we had, a couple advanced camps in a row on like my second year of doing camps here in Folsom. And the advanced campers had this really weird thing where they didn't want to admit that they couldn't do something. So I would assign something and I would say, all right, uh, who wants to come up on the kit and try it? Cause they're all on practice pads. And everyone would just go, I'm good. I got it. And I'm like, wait, you all have this thing that I just showed you. That's amazing. How is that possible? I haven't even seen any of you move a limb. And I realized like, oh, wow, like you guys are scared of your failure. You're scared to come up here and fail. We, we need to embrace this. And so then what I realized was each camp didn't really even take shape as a camp until everyone admitted, I can't do this. And it's like, well, finally, now that you admit that you can't do it, I can help you through this. I can teach you how to do it, but I can't teach you how to do something that you think you can already do when I know you can't, because there's nowhere for us to start. So then... Um, you know, it started being something we'd say at camp, like, guys, you just got to embrace the suck. When you find something you can't do, when you find a weak link in your armor, that's your time to get excited. Why get excited about the things you can already do? You can't grow from that. And then we eventually started printing out the bracelets. And on day one, everyone gets an embrace the suck bracelet. And when I feel like the camp has truly embraced the suck, usually day three or day four, then we hand out the eliminate the suck bracelets. So it's like, you got to embrace it first. Aww. But you can't just embrace it and be like, I suck, and then walk away. It's like, okay, I suck. <laughs> now I got to fix this. <laughs> That's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfinished statement. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it comes, somebody told me that it comes from the military. So I'm pretty sure I didn't make it up. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's just a general mindset of embrace. Yeah. You know, the, I think what you said is a much more complete sentence, which is embrace the journey. The journey is mm. so much, I mean, because once you get to the destination, your mind has already moved on to a new destination. So you never really yeah. get there anyways. The yeah. journey is the thing that we all have to fall in love with. Exactly. Going back to this, uh, to this experience, uh, is there a chance that this teacher giving you the Samba Ostinato to play the Paradiddle on top, he maybe took a step too further that you weren't prepared and he didn't listen to you? 
probably he said, it's like I don't, whoever comes in here today is going to get this and I don't yeah. care. That's exactly what we talked about at the beginning. And that's what I experienced was you never tested my independence level. You, you just knew that I asked to learn how to play like you, but you have to still assess my skill set. Um, and I think what he would have found out was like, okay, you can read jazz band charts. You've grown up in school music, so you can play symphonic snare drum pieces. You can play marching pieces but you have no four-way independence. That's at least if I was the teacher, that's what I would have found out in two minutes and been like, okay, we're going to build up to this really cool thing. And, and then I also, especially him knowing that I loved rock, he should have then found examples of Samba from Igor Calvera in Sepultura. He should have found examples of world music in rock to say, okay, I know you don't recognize this as the Cuban Songo, but he's doing it between a, a China and a 20 inch, you know, gong drum. And this is the song go. And I would have been like, I would have been so amped to learn that stuff if he could have related it to me. Mm. But instead it was just like, Hey, this is hard. Go work on it. And I'll see you next time. And to me, I always say teaching without passion is demonstration. Teaching with passion is education. He just demonstrated something for me and then let me go. Um, and so he wasn't my teacher for very long. Um, but you know, then, then from that moment on, and, and when you're 15, you don't know a good teacher from a bad teacher. But then from, from that point on, when I would encounter true educators like Pete Magadini, like Will Kennedy, who I studied with later, um, these people that had a passion for unlocking doors for their students, then I just, I, be, I just fell in love with that whole thing. And that's what I wanted to be great at. You know, um, If I wasn't here, I don't care if anybody thinks that I had something to do with online drum lessons in the beginning or anything like that. I just would want them to be like, he had a really cool blue sparkle kit and he had a super serious passion for education. And that's, you know, cause that's what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, when did you stop uh, taking lessons? So Will was my last teacher, Will Kennedy. That was probably four or five years ago, only because he got really busy with the Yellow Jackets and I was busy with camps and stuff and it was making it kind of tough. Um, so that was my first time taking online drum lessons. Uh, I reached out to him. He's been one of my, I wasn't friends with him. I didn't know him, but he's been one of my heroes since I was a kid. He was on, before I knew about the Yellow Jackets, he was on a Bobby McFerrin album uh, called Bang Zoom. And it was pretty much the Yellow Jackets were the rhythm section for that album but that was one of my favorite albums of all time. And uh, so I was just obsessed with Will Kennedy. And I don't think anyone in the world plays six, eight as beautifully as he does. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I got his number from Modern Drummer. Uh, they had his phone number and, uh, and I was writing for Modern Drummer at the time. So they, they were kind enough to give it to me and I called him and it was a very funny conversation because he was like, I, I don't teach. And I said, I, kn I know you don't. I thought he lived in the Bay Area at this time, which is only about an hour and a half a drive from me, from me. So I thought, no big deal. I'll drive to the Bay Area and take my lessons because that's what I used to do with Pete. And I said, I, I know you don't, sir, but I, I think that you are the key to what I'm looking for. Like I'm a touring rock drummer that wants to be a fusion player. And, and I'm, I, I can't stop hitting so hard. I, I play with two B's and <laughs> really thick drum heads and I don't want to be that drummer anymore. But, you know, so I thought Will was like the, the person to get me there. So we were talking, he's like, okay, I, I get it, man, but I need to know that you're serious. And I'm like, I'm very serious, you know, and I really want to do this. We go around, around over and over again. And he's like, I just don't want to teach you. And then you maybe fall out of love with the drums or maybe you're just not serious about drumming. And so I was like, uh, okay, you know, the Pearl ad you're in right now, like the big full page Pearl ad in drum magazine. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, you're on page one. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm on the cover of that. And he's like, Mike Johnston. And I'm like, yes. I was like, I'm very serious. He's like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know who you were. I was like, that's okay. I just, yes, I'm very serious about drumming. I, I'm sorry to pull the cover card on you, but I want drum lessons from the best and you're the best. And oh so he was God. like, oh man, I, okay, yeah, I know who you are. You're the online teacher guy. And I'm like, yes. Um, I'm like, but I want to be a good drummer. I don't want to be the online teacher guy. I want to be a player, you know? And I just, and I think that sometimes as pros, we need to admit like, but I need help. Like I've gone as far as I can go. Sometimes we need help in the form of inspiration. You know, you assigning me something will get me to do it because I want to make you proud even though I could have practiced it on my own, but I, I wasn't inspired to practice on my own or I wasn't motivated to. And so having Will in my corner and 
you know, when he started teaching me, it was, uh, I found out he lived in Houston. So I said, don't worry, I can make this work. I have technology on my side. We'll do video exchange. Um, and like I said, this is only a few years ago. And so, but he would, he was, he was a tough teacher, a really tough teacher. And I was learning freedom land and a few other yellow jackets tunes. And then he would assign very specific rhythmic phrases that he wanted me to learn to bring into my playing. And he was, you know, like it, it's hard to explain because he was so supportive of my journey, but he wouldn't let me off easy. And he would just say, I'm sorry, you, you got to do it again. Like the feel is not there. You're playing the parts, but I don't feel anything. And I was like, okay, this is the, this is the real stuff, right? Like when someone gives us a PDF, it's binary code. It's either a one or a zero. We can either do it or we can't. When somebody says it doesn't feel right, then that's lonely practice. That's sitting in a room. No one gives you feedback. You have no idea if you got any better after six hours. And I just remember he was, I think he was, I don't know, maybe in London or something, but I had sent him like my 10th video on Freedom Land, the song that he wanted me to learn. And just seeing him hold his phone, sitting on the balcony and going like, man, it's there. And he was, he's like, I'm cheesing. You can see my teeth. And I mean, I don't know if I've ever felt as accomplished or as happy in my entire career as I did with him just saying, I'm proud of you. So if we can find that, and if, if our listeners or your listeners can find that in their teacher where it's like, God, I just want to make you proud. There's just no better motivation and driving force than that. You know? Cool. I guess that answers one of the questions, which is how do you keep your students motivated? <laughs> yeah. I mean, try, luckily I've been the student and, you know, uh, so it's just trying to get them to feel that way. COVID was a tough time for that because, you know, what happens on the motivational scale is in a normal year without obviously COVID or quarantine or anything, all drummers, all musicians have an imaginary gig in their head. It does not matter whether they're gigging or not in their minds, you know, Kira student who is like, I don't know, 47 years old. And she used to be a chiropractor, but now she's going to retire and play drums for fun. In her mind, she thinks she's going to walk down the streets of London and there's going to be a pub having a blues jam and someone's going to go, is there a drummer around here? And Kira's student is going to go, I can do it. Like that's in their minds all the time. And when we took that away from the entire world for over a year, that really messed things up because people were wondering, why am I practicing? I'm never going to get to use this skill set. You know, it'd be like practicing karate on an island by yourself. You're never going to fight anyone. Why do you need to, why do you need to have this skill set? Um, by the way, I'm not violent. I don't know why I chose that example. Um, but yeah, so I think that that was the time for me to step in as my student's educator, you know, with, with my website and say, okay, now we've got weekly homework assignments. You, I am going to use you in my social media. You will be seen by the public instead of your 50 followers, it'll be my 150,000 followers. And that pressure put on them something like, okay, then I'm going to practice harder than ever. And I'm going to press that red button, the record button, and I'm going to freak out. And I'm going to do it 10 times instead of one time. And we saw so much growth throughout the Mike's Lessons family because of those homework assignments and our virtual shed sessions and our family practice sessions. It was like, if you guys are at home, then I'm going to be your lifeline to mental health. Let's just do this together and be as social as we can because I built this infrastructure in 2006. Like, you know, COVID was no big deal for me on a tech level because I've been doing this for, you know, almost two decades. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I just tried to leverage it as far as keeping them as active as possible and keeping those imaginary gigs alive in their heads. Cool. Has um, Corona made you reassess anything in your life? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Traveling. Um, and I don't mean that in a funny way. I just mean, I used to, if I wasn't hosting a camp here, I was out on the road doing a clinic tour in a different country. I was doing drum festivals in a different country. Um, I mean, generally what happens is if I get added to a drum festival, then we use that opportunity, the flight that gets me there. It's like, well, now that I'm in France, let's do a tour. Or now that I'm in Germany, let's do a tour or whatever. So I was traveling so much. And I think it's important for us, for drummers, especially, you know, people way above my pay grade, the, the Weckles, the Vinnies, like there's nothing like seeing one of those people in person and feeling the air come out of their bass drum port and all that, like so important. And I wanted to give that to people that had only seen me on YouTube or Instagram. I want them to be in the room and experience everything. 
But to do that, I have to leave my website, which is my full-time job. I have to leave it for a week or two weeks. And, and that travel, I mean, especially pre, even pre COVID travel was just, it's just tough. It beats you up, you know, um, because our industry is not a wealthy industry. So it's not like when I go to Singapore, it's not first class, you know, it's, it's nine flights to get there. Um, so it just beats you up. You get there, you're just wrecked. And then they just take you from the airport to the stage and you're like, Hey guys, what's up? Mike Johnston. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if my in-ears are working, but here we go. This is a song in 15. Wish me best. And yeah. So, so yeah, so I mean, it, it was kind of tough. So I think that now I'll, my wife and I, so my wife is kind of the, um, she runs mikeslessons.com on the administrative side, on the business side, and she's the one that handles all the offers that come in. You know, now it's much, it used to be yes to everything. Anything that comes, yes, I'm doing it. Um, don't care what the pay is. Let's just get my name out there. Now it's definitely going to be more like, okay, the UK drum show. Yeah, that's a, that's a well-run event. Um, I've done it before. I know what the benefit is. It's a well-attended event and we could probably tack on two or three clinics to the end of that. Let's do that one, you know, but I'm going to be much more selective about the travel, even after I am vaccinated and everything. Cause mm -hmm. I think that, um, yeah, it's just, I, I've just really fallen in love with teaching online. And, and like I said, I just really lucked out that I had such a massive head start. So I didn't have to scramble to try to create an online community. That was the one thing I would say that I did have, even if everyone had the same cameras and the same tech, the one thing I did have was a built-in family of thousands of drummers that were used to what we were doing. And, and if they take a lot of pressure off of me because we do have advanced students and they support and they answer some questions that I don't have time to answer. So I just kind of refell in love with it. I mean, a lot of people, I said this on a podcast with Matt Halpern, but right before COVID, I was actually shutting down everything. Mikeslessons.com. I was leaving the drum industry. I was just going to teach um, cameras. I was opening up learn video with Mike.com and I was just kind of, you know, over it. And then COVID made me refall in love with the thing all over again, like from scratch. Wait a minute, you were gonna you were gonna shut down Mike's lessons. I was, yeah. I I just gotten to a point where that's a big revelation. Yeah, I mean, and I'd thought about it for a very long time. And um what was happening at the time was there were just it's kind of a hard thing to explain, but maybe you guys will understand. But the drums are a really personal thing to all of us because when bad things happened in our lives, we retreated to the drums. We put on our headphones, we closed our eyes and we forgot about the breakup or the bad grades or fighting with our parents or whatever it was. So when normal business things happen in the drum industry, it really messes with my heart and my brain. Like, and when I mean like when I see somebody literally post what I posted the day before oh, okay, and just yeah. steal the stuff, it's kind of like, come on, man. like. That's why I go so far out of my way to celebrate the people that do things originally. Cause I'm like, man, even if you're my competition, at least you're doing it in a way that I've never even thought of. That is beautiful. And I, I respect that. And so that was happening a lot and it was kind of building up and building up. And I just thought, I just don't want to care this much about who posted what, who framed their symbols, who did what, like, I don't want to care about this stuff. I don't care. I just want to teach drums. And I thought, okay, but I don't have any emotional connection to cameras everybody owns one. I've had to learn how to use them and how to learn how to do everything by myself. Cause we don't have a, there's no employees. I mean, mikeslessons.com is just me and my wife. Um, and I just thought I'll just do that. And that way, if somebody did normal business stuff, you know, and you have competitors and people are stealing ideas and borrowing ideas, it, it won't hurt my feelings. Cause it's business. Yeah. I get it. But when it happens in the drum world, it does hurt sometimes, you know? Um, and then, yeah, so I had a, I had a construction crew coming to bulldoze all my walls and I was going to make one giant space to film in. And the, the next day was day one of quarantine here in California. And they said, I, we can't come in. Uh, we, our foreman shut us down. We can't. And I was like, no, 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 I'm changing my whole life. You got to get your ass down here now. And they're like, I'm sure it'll just be a day or two. And I was like, okay, that seems weird but all right and then um yeah so in the time until the quarantine was lifted i rediscovered my absolute love for teaching drums and i just i made my peace with what we all have to deal with you know and, and i also realized how much of i mean this is something i've never said but i realized how much of a part of it i was too i'm sure there's really great drummers out there that could look at my stuff and go 
dude, he totally took that from me. And, you know, I think what I had to figure out is what do I think is our property? Like the paradiddle isn't my property or your property. It just exists. But there's those little tiny things where it's like, I don't know. I've never heard anybody say it the way I said it. When you steal that, that's what hurts my feelings. Todd Zuckerman's first DVD, Methods and Mechanics. I have to look back at my past and go, you know what? There's a lot of my YouTube content that came straight out of that DVD. <laughs> I did my best to like put my own spin on it, but there's no denying that I couldn't teach a bludgeda until that video came out. I couldn't teach so many licks and chops until he broke them down. He has every right to feel the way I'm feeling. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of Benny Greb stuff that when his first DVD, uh, The Language of Drumming came out, it was it was the new breed. It was it was a grid system. There was nothing monumental about it except for how he delivered the information. He revolutionized that part. And, you know, I think that that's the thing that now I take a lot of pride in is the delivery because the content is set in stone and it's all of ours. Um, so yeah, I had to kind of make my peace with all of that. Um, sorry that we're turning this into a deep podcast. That's all right. That oh, I love it. They're my fave. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's the real stuff was like, okay, well, there's a lot of negative feelings going on. That's why I was leaving. I wasn't leaving for any reason other than I don't want to feel this negatively or this, this much negativity towards drummers or towards the drum industry. So mm -hmm. let me just get out of it and play the drums for fun. Mm -hmm. Then I refell in love with it. And then I also understood, especially with COVID happening, look, everyone has to scrap just to make it. I don't care how you do it anymore. I just, I just want you to stay in the game, you know, whatever it takes, even if it means that I got to get on the phone with you and help you set up your streaming tech, I'm going to do it. Cause this is, this is childish to feel this way about anything related to the drums, you know? Cool. Well, I get you, you know, you put a lot of time in and when someone's kind of taking exactly your thing, it can be a bit, yeah, I mean, the thing, okay, like, Kira, a perfect example would be your time signature challenge, right? It's not that you're the first person to challenge somebody with time signatures. It's just if you saw it two days after you put it up by somebody else, you'd be like, can you just wait a month? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, Felipe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kira. Sorry, Kira. I'll no, wait a month. Wait I'll, 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 wait, my thing. I'll wait a month next time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have baited some of the people where I, I would tell like, you know, a friend, I'm like, all right, I'm going to post a picture of my dog. Let's see how long it takes this person to post a picture of their dog. <laughs> if they think that that's the secret to success. Like the thing that we all have to realize is me making cups of matcha, that has nothing to do with being successful on Instagram. Me having a thing is the thing. You just have to find whatever that is. Like I didn't, I didn't sit down and go like, what should I do? Well, Peter McKinnon has coffee. I'll do tea. Like it was like, look, I've been drinking tea like a freak since I was in my twenties and stopped drinking sports drinks. And now I'm obsessed with matcha. I want to share this with people. I think that that's the biggest tip for all social media for all of us is like, if you can't help, but to share it with the world, that's a good post. doesn't matter how many views it gets. doesn't matter how many likes it gets. If you're trying to keep up with the algorithm and beat out your competitors, it's not going to work. Um, you know, I always say like, if it's trending, you already missed it. That's, exactly. yes. that's it. If it's trending, yes. you've already missed it. So stop, create a new trend. Exactly. Kira, that's no one um, to love. No, no. Sorry. Oh. Last question. Two. Let me have two questions. All right. Two questions. <laughs> Just because I copied your, 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 uh, your art. Time. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I didn't mean to throw a wrench into the, the, the well, marriage. That's fine. <laughs> this, this is, this is the end of our partnership. It was okay, nice. Fantastic. It was nice meeting you, Kira. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> you got it. Listen, anyone can do a time signature thing. It's fine. Yes. And that, and that's the thing is like everyone. Just wait a month. Can, yeah, exactly. You just have to, you have to put your own spin on it. And I remember when I saw yours, Kira, I just thought like, well, that was cool. And then the follow-ups were cool because you kept coming back and saying like, look, I know this can be scary. Let me walk you through it. Well, that's something mm -hmm. I hadn't seen other educators do. And so that's why you're not muted on my feed <laughs> because <laughs> I respect the way you teach. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So one question was you do have, you have so many followers and you must have loads of DMS and all this stuff. How do you like, 
shut that off, like the pressure or if you feel any pressure, but do you have like days where you're like, right, I'm not going to look at my phone or how do you cope with the busyness? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I've been told many times that I need to delegate and not do everything by myself, but I'm an only child. It just, it's easier for me. I've tried to work with others. It doesn't work. Um, so <laughs> one, one part of it that is different for most musicians and most, especially tour musicians is this is my full-time job. Like all day long, I'm at this studio all by myself, either making content or responding to people. So it's not like I'm doing all of that while having another job. So that's one big part of it. But the other thing is it's, I, I have, I have a buffer, which is mikeslessons.com. And the thing is like, you can DM me whenever you want. And I might be able to get back to you. I might not. I don't really know. But when you pay for a service, now you have my undivided attention. And mm -hmm. that's part of that payment. You know, I think that it's important for people to realize generally you're not paying for education when you sign up for online drum lessons or online guitar lessons or whatever. You're paying for the organization of that content because everything I could ever teach you is already out there on YouTube. But it'll take you six years of searching to find what I can do for you in one course, because I already did all of that work. So you're paying for the organization and you're paying for the delivery. You might be able to learn the, the same thing that I'm teaching from another teacher, but they're not passionate when they speak to a camera and maybe I am. So you're paying for the delivery, you're paying for the organization, and then you're paying for my attention. And when you send me, uh, you know, through mikeslessons.com, when you're sending me emails and stuff, I get to those right away. The DMs, unfortunately, some of them work, some of them slip through the cracks, you know, and then you always have to like go to that third tab, the all. And I'm like, Oh, Jesus, there's 150 <laughs> new ones in there. Oh, God. <laughs> and so and it's like, it's it sucks, because you want to write everybody and be like, I'm sorry, that I didn't respond. I'm sorry that I didn't like your story post. I didn't even see it. So I think you do have to just take some of the pressure off yourself and also realize too, that they understand that, you know, your followers, your fans, your students, they understand that it's just impossible to keep up with all of it. So I'm doing my best. And I, I feel like we as, as social media people and educators at the same time, we have to give people like a little bit of, of guidance. And, you know, you know, that if I make a post today, if you want my attention, comment on the post, because I am checking that post throughout the day and I will respond to you. But if you're the, you know, the 127th DM of the day, I just, it's not that I won't respond. I just didn't see it in the first place. Um, so yeah, and then I do have a hard cutoff. Like, so I go home every night for dinner right around 6 p.m. And when I get home, my phone stays in my car, in the garage. I don't bring it into the house with me. And then it's family mic. There's no sticks, there's no pad. It's me, the wife and the dog and sitting on the couch and making dinner and family time. Um, and then when it's time for bed, I'll go in the garage, grab my phone, plug it in. And I, I just don't see it until the morning. But I think we all just have to, at some point, say enough is enough. This has become too addictive. And you have to just really pay attention to how it's affecting your mood. Mm -hmm. um, if it's making you better, then great. You know, but spending a lot of time on my phone doesn't make me a happier person. So cool. Okay. This is the last one. Now. Last this one is from this is the banger. Well, it's not from me. Uh, someone messaged me to ask you this. Okay. Do you have any advice about teaching younger students or people who battle to focus or retain information? Um, how many apps? This is like a two question question. How many absolute beginners do, do, does, does he teach these days? Okay. Um, it's from someone who's a big fan. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, so as far as teaching beginners uh, or, or young kids and trying to get them to focus, you know, one thing we have to do is because we know that students, especially private students, equal dollars um, or pounds or whatever you want to call it. That's a tough thing that puts us in a weird place because somebody will come to us and say, my son's three. He's got so much natural talent. And if I'm a broke 20 year old trying to pay rent, that three-year-old equals $100 or $120 a month. It's hard to say no to that, even though the truth is me telling the, the parent, look, I can't tell you what your son or daughter can't do, but I can tell you it's very hard for anyone under five to retain the information that I would be teaching in a half hour private lesson. If you want me just to have your kid around drums for a half an hour once a week, 
I'm happy to do that, but I don't want you to have high expectations that they're going to retain anything. If anything, I will give your son or daughter a half hour of drum set exposure. I'll create drum games. I will tell the, you know, your son or daughter, like, all right, I'm going to give you this stick and I want to see if you can break this drum head. And I'll let the kid just <laughs> whack at it and go, cause they can't. And, and it's, <laughs> it's awesome. And, and it takes their mind off of things rather than me trying so desperately to appease the parents of like, okay, I just need you to learn a damn paradiddle so I can go out to the lobby and show them that I did something. I, I think that having that conversation with the parents is really important and just saying, look, here's what we're gonna do. We're expose your kid to drums. I'm gonna make sure that the drums don't turn into homework so that they hate it. I don't want that to happen. A kid at any minute can be like, oh, by the way, I like soccer, I'm out. And they just quit a hobby that the parents have poured thousands of dollars into. So it's my job to make sure that that thing is fun and that it represents having fun. And then pretty much I wait until that student is committed themselves. When they start asking me things like, hey, so what's a B20 symbol? I'm like, oh my God, how do you know what that is? You're seven, that's amazing. Okay, so it's 20% <laughs> tin and 80% copper and that makes an alloy called B20 and I get all excited. Um, <laughs> I just start freaking out. Um, and then it's like, okay, now I can be your drum teacher. I have been your babysitter and your buddy and your uncle. And now I'm your drum teacher. So I think that that's one thing to recognize as far as people that don't retain information. Well, whether they're young or old, that's our job as teachers is to crack the code and be like, wow, okay, this isn't working. That's not your fault. That's my fault. I'm clearly teaching you the way that I taught someone else that doesn't learn the way you learn. So let's dig deep and find out how do you learn? Um, you know, it's tough for me as like a, a schooled educator to teach somebody when they say, I don't ever want to learn notes. And I'm like, oh, but it's so easy for me to give you a page and say, come back tomorrow and do this. But some people don't learn that way. And it's like, okay, well then I'm going to play this rhythm. See if you can repeat it and I'll play it and they nail it. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. So you learn by ear. That's fine. Then I got to shift my focus for this one half hour a day. Um, so I think that that's the key. Like that's what being an educator is, is that every student learns differently and we have to adapt to that and we have to enjoy that. I mean, that's, that's part of our growth as deliverers of information. Cool. Really? Excellent. <laughs> wow. I've learned a lot today. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt no, it. I did, especially about Kira. Yeah, there we go. What? I was going to say, you have two Chinas. I can't teach you anything. I can't teach anybody. Oh, you can teach, you can teach me how to use the two Chinas. I have them. I never saw they play them. Yeah, they, but they look good. They look yeah. good. Wow, that's, that's, why I, that's why I have them. Yeah. Some people have stereo microphones. You have a stereo pair of Chinas. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, don't judge me, but I don't have a China right now. I, I don't either. I, I think this is something important, too. We have to tell all of our students you should have on your kit what you sing in your head. And mm. when you when you sing things, if you're singing little short things, get a splash. If you're singing, ka, ka, get a china. Um, I don't sing, duka, 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 so I don't have a double bass pedal. If I, ha if I sang <laughs> duka, duka, in my head, I would get a double bass pedal. So I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I shouldn't have a drum kit at all then. <laughs> you don't sing it. Oh, yeah, you just, you just sing beautiful bagpipe <laughs> melodies. I get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I should buy. I'm going to sell all my drums and buy a bagpipe. Do it. I, I get it. Do it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for everything. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, boss. You it was welcome. great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.